several references is Esther 414. And they always quote a time such as this. So I consider this uh, an honor to share this moment with you on our holiday. I was asked to talk about the Jewish Christian relationship and what it means beyond just Christians standing with Israel. And I wanna sort of give you a personal testimony of how I ended up in the last 17 years, putting my whole entire life into building up better communication between Jews and Christians. First, you should just know I'm the executive director for the first Orthodox Jewish center in the entire world to religiously and theologically dialogue with you. And my story really begins uh, when I was a little child, uh, growing up as a Jewish person in New York City for the first eight years of my life, okay. the fondest memory I have Canadian bacon with my grandmother and Maxwell House percolated coffee, and basically grew up as a secular Jew with uh, very few, very very little knowledge about Judaism. And in, in, in Judaism, we have eternal missionaries where we want Jews to be better Jews. And I was a prime target for my father's colleague at work. And since I was getting beat up in public school because I was a short kid, uh, the colleague of my father suggested that I go to the most religious school possible in Brooklyn, New York. And so at the age of eight, I went from Knight Rider and Dukes of Hazard on Friday night to slowly becoming Sabbath observant. And eventually it worked. My family became uh, religious Jews. And I ended up in the Harvard of Yeshivot, uh, a Jewish religious school with, in the black hat world. So if you ever see Jews in black hats with a little long side locks, that used to be me. And when you grow up in that environment, you are told not to really interface with the greater secular world. And uh, we actually are taught all the negative historical dates of what the church did in name of Jesus to the Jewish people. So the mere fact that I am here tonight from Israel speaking to you is nothing but God's hand in my life to better the relationship between Jews and Christians because this was not in the cards. And from there, uh, we were actually taught in yeshiva that entering into a church from a very strict legal interpretation is actually forbidden. And I actually have friends when we when we uh, were coming across a church, we could go across the street so we wouldn't pass the church directly. So we grew up very much with a prejudice against Christians because of what happened in the past. <clears throat> and so ending up in Jewish Christian relations, I have to fast forward from my life into John Jay College of Criminal Justice, taking a bachelor's in forensic psychology. I actually ended up on a campus not only is it known through the CSI world and anything that has to deal with forensic science, but John Jay College was also a 45% African-American, 45% Latino uh, college. And I was the white Jew on campus, but it actually helped me to develop the skills later on because I actually led the Jewish Student Society where 99% of its membership were Gentiles. Uh, so I think that experience at John Jay helped me. And then I went on to my master's at University of Pennsylvania, and I got the political bug in my first year in graduate school, taking a social policy class. And because of that social policy class, I interned in uh, City Council of New York during, during the Giuliani administration. And that was a fascinating time. And I began to understand a little bit about the political world. And because of my two years of experience, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, the Israeli consulate was looking for a Jewish person to help them with campaign 2000 between Al Gore and George Bush. And my first day on the job was the UN Millennium Summit where Prime Minister Ehud Barak and his whole entourage was coming in. And I was responsible for taking care of the prime minister's visit. So that was a sink or swim day, but thank God I got through that. And a few, and that was a time when Israel was actually praised among the United Nations. That was a, actually a miracle because usually the United Nations has no problem condemning us. 
And through that experience, it, I was the person who was dealing with the media for every single day. This is before Google and chats and even that was fashionable to have emails. We used to fax the email to about 100,000 people each day about what was happening in Israel. And when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict broke out in November, uh, it literally the media was vicious against the state of Israel. And we were trying our best to get Israel's narrative in the media. And I happened to have a, uh, a deputy consul general, Yossi Livne, who spoke Spanish. And I put him on Telemundo television towards the end of two, the year 2000. Speaking pastor, saw what was going on with Israel, heard what my boss was saying, and received a calling from God to do a night to celebrate Israel in Spanish. So he invited my boss, and my boss accepted the invite. And this is the early of 2001. And at the last moment, an hour before the Sabbath, my boss calls me up and says, listen, this church event for Israel, I can't go. Something happened in Israel. I have to go on TV tonight. It's only a half a mile walking distance from where you live. Can you please go instead of me? And here was my, my dilemma. Do I value my job or do i value my religious upbringing because this would be the first time going to a church and i must confess in front of you today that i valued my job and i accepted the invite and but you have to understand back then the only understanding of christianity was catholicism and i would say even medieval catholics i all i thought you were all medieval catholics first of all you have hollywood movies and i think your sister act too and I just think you have stained glass windows, you have organ music, you, everyone's dressed a certain way, you have some type of pool in the back, and I don't understand that, but somehow you like dunking. And um, I'm just not knowing what's gonna happen when I entered into this church. Lo and behold, it was a Pentecostal charismatic church, a very big, gigantic building, no stained glass windows. Um, and I see, actually a cross in the corner of my eye and my understanding of christianity is you usually have jesus on the cross and it's very big and depending which church you had you know they're depicting the whole crucifixion and here here i am i see the cross from the corner of my eye and i'm like oh my god jesus fell off the cross what are we going to do should i tell the pastor or should i not tell the pastor and uh, i decide because i'm jewish i wasn't going to go ahead and say anything to the pastor uh, but whatever happened that particular Friday evenings, Monday morning comes along, the ambassador calls me into his office and he says, you did a great job. You are now in charge of Christian affairs. I'm like, wait a second. This is the first time I'm entering into a church. I have no idea about anything about Christianity because I am the token religious Jew in the Israeli consulate does not make me the expert to actually do this portfolio. So in Christianese terms, I needed to pray about it. In Jewish terms, I really needed to think about this. And I go to my pulpit rabbi, who originally gave me the dispensation to actually go to the church on, on Friday. And I asked him, I said, what do you think? And he reveals to me that he was involved in Jewish Christian relations for, 20, for the last 25 years. And I said, should I do this? He says, of course you should do this. And he begins to lay out a whole theological vision of how to go ahead and do this portfolio. Jews and Christians believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have a common scripture that we believe is the divine word of God. We are supposed to be his active agents to bring the kingdom of heaven down to earth. And we're all waiting for that messianic moment together. Obviously there are theological differences between Judaism and Christianity, but what is in common out, far outweighs what divides us. And we begin to lay out this covenant theological vision for me and i was a sort of a deer in headlights i i didn't get what he was saying but i just simply said rabbi if you think i should do this i will say yes and then he added something as an advice piece of advice for me that still i listen to today after 17 years of saying that yes to to doing jewish christian relations he said if you're going to lead in this calling you must be led 
by him, by that voice. And it will take you into circumstances and situations that you've never thought you would be going into. It will be uncomfortable at first, but the whole purpose of Jewish Christian relations is actually the interaction between both faith communities bettering our relationship together. So with that, I go back to the ambassador and I tell him I'll take on the portfolio for on three conditions. Number one, I need to learn about Christianity. I think it's dishonest entering into a relationship with you without understanding who you are. Number two, um, we have to do this from covenant, not from a media strategy. And then my the ambassador thought I was a theological genius. I just parroted everything that my rabbi said. And number three, um, I asked for my rabbi to come aboard. So with that, uh, the ambassador said to me, okay, I have no problem with that, but you have to write a white paper on every single denomination, their theological and political stance on Israel. So some of you are looking at me like, whoa. And again, I, I must reiterate, I thought you were all Catholics. I didn't learn about the Protestant Reformation in my Talmudic classes. But when I, was, when I began researching about Christianity, I learned that you have tens of thousands of movements. You have 2 billion people that identify themselves as Christians. And I was just like, wow, this is an, this is an interesting history. We have 16 million Jews three major denominations, two billion Christians, and almost 30,000 movements. And this is your Lutherans, your Episcopalians, your Baptists. No, there's Southern Baptists, there's Northern Baptists, there's 150 independent Baptist movements. And that's besides your Greek Orthodox, your Armenians and Syrians and all that, all that type of movement and denominations. So this was quite a, a task of trying to sort of make sense of this history and then present it to to the Israeli consulate. And I also had to come up with a strategy. And at the end, I must confess, I, I wanted to go with the Catholics because then there was about 35 years of Jewish Catholic relations between the Jewish people. And there was also Vatican Israel relations that happened in the early nineties. So we know who the people are and they're appointed to these positions. So it's much easier to deal with them. It was just kind of difficult of dealing with in the Protestant world because Jews love to have one spokesperson who could represent all of Christianity. And it makes my, my job much easier. And I actually, how naive I was back then, I just thought, wow, I can solve the whole problem for me to deal with everybody if just all the Christians will go ahead and say, hi to the Pope and, and here to his leadership. But obviously, as you learn, you don't do that. You can't do that. And you have to build up this relationship, one pastor, one congregation at a time, and just be led on how to build up the relationship. So after, after six months of researching all the movements and trying to come up with a strategy, I actually decided that, okay, this whole thing started with um christian invited me to a church service for prayer i should just go back to these people to see if they would go ahead and consider uh an idea that i had about how we could do jewish christian relations together so i uh, this is your seinfeld moment i ask the members of the church the leadership of the church to meet me at mendy's restaurant in grand central station to have a roast beef sandwich and matzo ball soup. And the idea I presented to them was, I want to create a day of prayer for the peace of Israel in the Israeli consulate. Since the Israeli consulate is part of Israeli so soil, even though it's located in New York. And they agreed. And I said, if you can get the leadership there, I will make sure we can get permission to do a Christian prayer service. And in March of 2002, we begin the first Christian prayer service for the peace of Israel. And there were two major leaders that were speaking at that point in time. And one of them happened to happened to be Robert Stearns from Eagle's Wings. And I saw an anointing in Robert. And I should just clarify, I didn't know what the word anointing meant back then. It's one of the terms I 
I was able to gain through my interactions with Christians. But I started anointing in Robert's life, and he understood Israel better than most most of most Jews that I I knew back then. And I again that voice said I should just go with with Robert, and we begin to launch the International Day of Prayer for the Peace of Jerusalem. So on the first Sunday of every October, Christians around the world, it actually gets broadcasted on God TV, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So that came from my office. In addition, we also created the first Christian birthright program of bringing Christians to Israel for three weeks, become educator ambassadors for Israel, and they get exposed to everything that, to the complexity of the state of Israel. And I was involved in other initiatives. And then in July of 2005, I finally make my way back home. I'm the first in the corruptment of my family in 2000 years to return back to Israel as a fulfillment of prayers of what my forefathers said that they were hoping that there would be an Israel in their time. Now I'm living with the state of Israel in my lifetime. And I go, and I'm just thinking there's never going to be an opportunity again, to enter into Jewish Christian relations. I'm gonna be, I'm an immigrant coming in uh, to a new country and trying to uh, make my way here. At, at the beginning, I was actually supposed to be the speechwriter for Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, but circumstances came along that I wasn't able to do that. And I ended up as a book salesman. And my fr that few, first few years living here as an immigrant in Israel. And then I got into high tech and in November of 2007, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, the chief rabbi of Efrat, gives me a call because he heard about my name. And he, was, he said to me that he was interested in opening up the first Orthodox Jewish center in the entire world to dialogue with Christians. Now, for the Orthodox Jewish world to be never really wanted to be part of the dialogue, there have been a handful of Orthodox rabbis that have been. But as a movement and as an institution, there's never been uh, an Orthodox Jewish institution to respond back to what was happening in, in Christianity. And so Rabbi Shlomo Riskin said to me, he got a calling from God because he was deeply affected by the Sisters of Mary from Darmstadt, Germany, a Lutheran author uh, order that their whole purpose is to atone for the misdeeds of their fathers as SS officers in the Holocaust. And these nuns came, 40 nuns came off of bus singing Nachamu Nachamu Ami, comfort ye my people, comfort ye my people in 2002 to the uh, community of Efrat <clears throat> that's parallel to Bethlehem. And there was no one visiting Israel because it was the height of the Intifada. And here were 40 nuns willing to go ahead and comfort the, the, uh, neighbor, the community of Efrat. And soon he met new Christians who felt a deep love for the Jewish people, were atoning for the past misdeeds of replacement theology. And because of that, Rabbi Riskin was deeply affected and he wanted to change the status quo of Orthodox Jews to be engaged with Christians. So he found out about me and in November 2007, we meet at Ben Gurion Airport. And this was the defining moment. And I told Rabbi Riskin, I said, listen, I know that your own rabbi forbids Jewish Christian theological dialogue. And I really don't see how you can make this thing happen. And but he said to me, I've always been in the company of one. At this point in time, Rabbi Riskin is 67 years old. And I've never been someone who listens to the crowd. If God has put something on my heart, then I'm going to move with it. And I said, Rabbi, if you're willing to take a risk and do this, I want to make history. And in 2008, the beginning of 2008, we opened up the first Orthodox Jewish Center in the entire world, the Center for Jewish Christian Understanding and Cooperation, to dialogue with you. It has been an amazing experience for me. Uh, 26 pastors inaugurated the center back in February of 2008. And since then, we have come up with a, a unique way to enhance the relationship between committed Jews and committed Christians that is based upon Hebrew Bible text study, bringing leadership to Israel to understand the Hebraic roots of their faith. We Every week, 
we do a food delivery to the persecuted Christian community in Bethlehem. And this is an Orthodox Jewish center helping out the persecuted Christians in Bethlehem because covenant land comes with covenant responsibility. And since this is the first time a Jewish majority is ruling over a Christian minority, it is our mandate to help the, the, the people in the land who are most marginalized. And the Christians are in Israel, the most marginalized. They are caught between ethnicity and religion. And those living in the Palestinian controlled territories they are actually not empowered to do much. Their voice cannot be heard. Right now in Gaza, Christians are for being forced to convert to Islam. And it's not easy being a Christian in, in, the, in Judea, especially in Bethlehem. And um, we're here to help them. In addition to that, we've created something called the Day to Praise, where we celebrate Israel's Independence Day and the Feast of Tabernacles with Psalms 113 to 118. These are Psalms and where the Jewish, Jewish world offers to God their thanks for his divine intervention into human history. We recite these Psalms during the biblical feast of Passover and Pentecost and the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's also, also Hanukkah. And after Hanukkah was the last time these Psalms were incorporated into Jewish worship for a particular holiday that was for God's divine intervention. 22 centuries later the state of israel is reborn and the rabbinate decided because of this great miracle in our lifetime it can only happen through god that we need to invoke these psalms again and you should just know that the inspiration for the day to praise came to me while i was attending all of roberts university i'm the first orthodox jew to be accepted into a spirit-filled campus and this will be sort of my transition to the whole Jewish Christian relational dialogue. Because until I was in Ola Roberts University taking this class in, of, in Romans, on the book of Romans in, in 2014, uh, I was in sort of a Christian Zionist bubble. I only knew Christians who love Israel, who told me I could not be a Christian without my Jewish roots. There were people who just the miracle of just listening to the stories of how Christians came to support the Jewish people is to me the second greatest miracle next to the reborn state of Israel. Uh, but if you're in that world, you don't know anything else. And I happened to end up in Oral Roberts University. Right now I'm completing my thesis in the Hebraic roots of the Holy Spirit from a Jewish point of view. Uh, Dr. Brad Young, some of you may know him, is my mentor. And I was able to get into Oral Roberts University because uh, Dr. Mark Rutland, who's a dear friend of mine, who heads a uh, global servants, a, a, not, a nonprofit organization that helps out women to get out from the sex, traffic in, in, uh, uh, sex trafficking. So he was the president at that time of Oral Roberts University. He was, he was also the former president of Southeastern University. And we became fast friends and he brings a group every year from his global servants organization to israel and this was also uh, around 20 2013 and he asked me to address his group and uh, i said sometimes you can learn the greatest lesson from the shortest verse in the bible and i said let's take an example from the apostolic writings from the new testament the shortest verse there is jesus wept and I said, if, if a Jew was tackling this text, we would ask why Jesus is weeping. And I said, if you look at the Greek word for what Jesus was doing and what the people were doing a couple of verses beforehand, they were wailing and Jesus was shedding a tear. And I think that was a profound lesson to be learned that you always bring humanity into a situation. You don't be a robot. There are people and his best friend is in front of him. So then I went into an Old Testament verse from the Tanakh, from the Hebrew Bible. And then I continued my, my message for his group. And then he came over to me and he said, you know, I spent six weeks researching about uh, what I was going to say about Jesus wept and you did it in two minutes. And that, as a joke, I said, so this must be my entrance exam into all Roberts University. And he said, if your rabbi is okay with it, apply and we'll try to make it happen. 
and uh, I enter up into uh, all Rob Chu University taking a master's in Christian theology. But one of the classes I took there was a book uh, on the book of Romans. And I have to give credit to the professor, Dr. Edward Watson. He gave me a book called The Four Perspectives on the Apostle Paul. And one of, one of the people in that book was Mark Nanos. And uh, if you want to understand Paul from a Hebraic perspective, Nanos is an amazing theologian from that perspective. But I began to learn the book of Romans truly from a replacement theology perspective, as opposed to what Christians would normally say to me in my Christian Zionist world, the only way I'm grafted into the Jewish covenant, um, and I only am who I am as a Christian through the Jews, that theological teaching is quite new on the scene of, uh, of theology in the Christian world. And basically, most what is taught in the book of Romans is that Jews are the fallen branches and not the root at all. So I got to learn the book of Romans from replacement theological eyes. And then my world began to open in the sense that I really appreciated Christians who stand for Israel because you are truly a remnant within a remnant of Christendom. I think most Christians are indifferent to Israel. There's a lot of replacement theology still in the mother milk of the church. For a Christian to actually go ahead and stand with the Jewish people and do what you're doing tonight, you have to overcome so much theological baggage to get there that that I have to say is truly a miracle in our time that you're willing to do some of the practice of the Hebraic roots. But it also meant that the person I'm dealing with in Jewish Christian relations that is saying they love me and they stand by me is truly a remnant. So if I would have to say how many Christians are proactive on their stance and calling with Israel, I would say probably around four to five million, as opposed to the 70 million number that's usually uh, given all over that there are 70 million evangelicals and there must be 70 million evangelicals who support Israel. And that I don't believe is true. So the reason why I'm bringing this out is the biggest core group that our standing with Israel is the people who pray for Israel. There are millions of people who pray for Israel. But I don't think that in that group, they necessarily understand what it means to develop a relationship with the Jewish people. There is, you know, I'm not, some people go ahead and they're on the bandwagon of Christian support for Israel because of some type of eschatology. So the way they look at Israel is to achieve their end of days theology. Therefore, I'm only used for something else. And that's not a relationship. A relationship means I'm having, I understand you as a people, as a living, breathing expression of covenant. Just I believe that Christians are also living and breathing out uh, covenant and their understanding of it. I think many people, even in the Christian Zionist world, can go ahead and support Israel but not, on the, not give validity to what Jews do within the context of their Judaism. And this, I believe, is where we actually need to develop the relationship. Because after, I call it the romance phase that people have within the call of Israel, and they're standing and they're waving the flags and they're singing Israeli songs, you're going to have to then eventually deal with the people. And how do we do that? And how do I, as, as a Jew, also not put the entire baggage of what the church did in the name of Jesus to someone who came to faith just now? We have a tendency sometimes as Jews that everyone thinks the way we do and experiences everything the way we do. And we then put that on a Christian. So for example, I'll, here's a good example uh, of Christians going to Yad Vashem and coming out of it and personally asking for forgiveness for what they did to me and i'm like but you didn't do anything to me i understand the what you're doing but and personally attaching yourself to that but i'm not going to put the entire holocaust history on the current christian of today what i want them to understand is that where christianity took replace, replacement theology and was the spiritual foundation for the holocaust that they should understand that but I'm not going to place it as something to go ahead and gain a relationship. 
with. The relationship should be based on covenant, should be based upon our common understanding of working through the Hebrew Bible, understanding the Judaisms of Second Temple period and what that meant. Not all Pharisees are bad. Um, in fact, you see this with Gamiel. Gamiel is the rabbi of Paul, but Gamiel, when the believers of Jesus are in his court, he doesn't try to kill them as the Sadducees are trying to kill the believers of Jesus. So Gamiel was a different type of Pharisee than Paul was in his pre-encounter with the resurrected Jesus. So Paul persecuted and murdered believers and Gamiel was saving them. And so my belief is that, and it's true, as you can check up all the, uh, the scholarship on that, there were different Pharisaical movements during the time of the Second Temple period. So because you have it, one of the things I find that's interesting in the language is Pharisees get a bad rep within the Gospels and Paul's writings. And I just think that uh, if we are truly developing a relationship, we should understand that what the context of what the Gospels were saying in Paul's letters, we're talking about certain groups with, within the Pharisaical movements. And so, so for there, so I have to say my, my experience at Oral Roberts University was, was amazing that I actually got to understand the mainstream of Christianity and to appreciate those who stand with us. The, the, the uh, topic for today is why Christians should support Israel. And it's a very interesting question because it means that there's something to question about should Christians support Israel? And I come from the, from the, uh, from the side of the aisle that says, of course, Christians should support Israel if they are sharing within our covenantal expression of faith. Uh, I don't see how you can go ahead and separate unless you believe in replacement theology and that we are no longer covenanted and the church has replaced Israel. And then every single positive thing in the Bible about Israel is the church and every single negative thing on Israel is the Jewish people. And we lost our covenantal relationship. And because of our rejection of Jesus, divine and savior, we are damned to internal hell. Then obviously there's nothing to talk about. There, you know, as far as a relationship is concerned, I am considered a non-covenantal entity vis-a-vis -vis Christianity. But if you do believe that Jews are covenanted, then there and that part of this is working with us, then there's a lot to talk about. So I begin with the covenant and and make that relationship continue and to build on that. And that requires a lot of patience. Most of Jewish Christian relations, in my experience, is showing up and willing to be there. Uh, that goes for Christian events that celebrate Israel. And that goes for uh, understanding how Jews also go ahead and trying to deal with this entire relationship at the same time. <clears throat> Christians at the end of the day, they have a theological conundrum. How is it that Jews ended up back to Israel despite their rejection of Jesus as divine and savior, how is it that they're still where they are today? That's a, and, are, and how do they get salvation? That is a theological conundrum for a Christian to some, come to terms with. For Jews, it is a historical issue and a cultural issue. We actually believe Christians will go to heaven. Uh, so for us, there is no exclusivity of how you get to heaven. As long as you believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you're carrying forth the biblical values, I will see you in heaven. Whether or not a Christian will give me that salvation, that's not for me. I don't determine my faith through Christian lenses. However, at the same time, Jews who we wish to be part of this have to understand that there are different movements and different types of Christians. And we can't just accept our notion of what we want from Christians. I don't, I'm against prepackaged Christianity as far as how to develop this relationship. Also, Jews should be understand that uh, for Christians, this is a new walk in their life. Uh, standing with Israel is not fully fleshed out completely. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of courage for those who go ahead and support Israel, they are quite lonely and Jews should understand that it's a lonely road for them. And that's the reason why you have your sense of community today because 
again, that you're doing some Jewish practices is usually not accepted into mainstream Christianity. So Jews have to also be educated on how to interface with you properly, not just for simply, not simply just because of one particular social justice issue, for example, with school vouchers, but I see you as a fulfillment of how we're supposed to do things together about kingdom and holiness and ensuring that the world knows about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Doug, this is my little talk about Jewish Christian relations. I'm going to ask right now because I can't see any of you. I'm going to rely on Doug right now of where I'm supposed to take the next step for, for this, uh, for this talk. If Doug, you can tell me or just uh, chat with me for a second to let me know where I'm supposed to go. If anyone has any questions in the audience, I don't want to violate the 11th commandment, thou shall not bore you. Uh, and I understand you, are have, you need to go to lunch. So Doug, if you can just tell me where I'm supposed to go with the talk. And while you're going to the computer and putting in your uh, in your question, I just want to take this uh, moment to just say thank you for standing with Israel. Thank you for having a conference like this. Thank you for um, seeing us as covenanted and willing to go ahead and have a relationship. And I just, for me, the best thing for you at the end of the day as part of this relationship is to actually come and visit Israel and take time to see your own faith, but also to interact with the people at the same time. We are located at the Bible Lands Museum Jerusalem now. We moved there from Efrat in August of 2016. And the Bible Lands Museum is a great way to visualize the Bible. We have all the artifacts but that are authentic from biblical times. Uh, we invite you to participate in our Hebraic Roots study of the Bible. Every Wednesday night, we have a uh, Bible study for the local Christian community. And every month we have a Christian Bible study in Arabic for the local Christian Arab community as well. So if there are no questions, I just wanna take this opportunity to say, greetings from Israel, happy Purim. Uh, just understand that Purim, when you quote Esther chapter four, verse 14, for a time such as this, that means that you are never silent again when it comes to the Jewish people and to helping them. That, that line is a commitment. And I just wanna let you know that our friendship to you as Jews to Christians is we wish to be your watchman on the wall. I know many of you have been standing in the gap for so many years and probably never got a thank you from the Jewish community. So let me be the first one to say thank you. But at the same time, Christianity around the world is facing a major dilemma. 90,000 Christians last year were murdered for their faith. And that doesn't take in consideration hundreds of thousands of people being persecuted for their faith. When a Christian is persecuted, it is as if I am persecuted. Because if there were Jews in that places where Christians are being persecuted, those people who persecute Christians would not hesitate to kill me as well. So I take it as a personal thing that Christians who get persecuted for their faith also is personal to me. So with that, since I'm not seeing any questions posted on our chat with Doug, I'm just going to say thank you for this opportunity. Blessings to all. Enjoy your meal. Happy Purim. Thank you.